In the last two years, the opening of the AmeriCatalyst agenda has focused on the potential for sovereign default in G20 nations and on-stage conversations with J. Kyle Bass, who is the founder and principal of Heyman Capital Management. For several years, Bass has warned that a global secular change, powerful, long-term directional moves that happen once every hundred years, is underway. Make that 50 years, maybe 20 years, okay? kind of often these days. Until recently, Kyle's perspective has run contrary to that of most investment managers whose investment decisions assume that current events mark a cyclical or short-term change. While Bass's predictions and investments focus on Japan as one of the major nations poised to fall, recent events point to the default of Greece as the initial trigger of a domino effect of default among the most highly indebted nations which could lead to the end of the fiat currency system. Following Greece, immediately under threat are Portugal, Ireland, Italy, and Spain. This year picks up where we left off last year as we move closer to what appears to be the beginning of a global financial crisis of epic proportions. Our conversation today discusses the potential timing, order, and magnitude of sovereign default and how Kyle is investing ahead of the curve. In the context of the debt-ridden global financial system, we also discussed the status of the United States, how it would be impacted by serial defaults in Europe, and its own potential for sovereign default. Kyle, thanks for being here. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> Todd, you want to you wanna start off? Sure. Um, Kyle and I probably uh, met and started talking about these macroeconomic and, and related financial market issues spring summer of 2009 shortly after I left the IMF and he reached out to me to talk about Japan in particular and very quickly we found that our concerns about Japan um, were broader than Japan and they included municipalities in this country and they included Europe and ultimately they may if we're not careful include the broader sovereign of the United States, not in some default sense per se, but in some other economic turmoil that it could, could lead to, and even, I think, um, political or even social if we're not careful. A lot of people are asking about the Occupy Wall Street thing and, and what that means, and I think it's something to be taken pretty seriously um, because of the tone that it might set. But where Kyle and I used to debate or argue even, where I, his fundamental analysis I think is super, super sound, um, and it's something that we should try to explore today. He's, he's one of uh, a number of people that I find in the broadly defined hedge fund world. Um, hedge funds sometimes get beat up a bit, but these guys really do their homework. Um, they really do their homework. And, and they go out and they test it and they question themselves and question themselves constantly. So I think he reached out to me at one point because he was questioning himself about Japan in some respects. The argument I used to make with Kyle where I disagreed with him and I, I increasingly stop disagreeing with him on this point, is policy does matter. And policy can change the direction of economic outcomes a bit. They can bend them. It's not, it's not exactly like the laws of physics. Economic laws are a little different, and policy can bend them. And I use the phrase, we're looking for orderly adjustments rather than disorderly adjustments. And so they certainly can bend them in time, and they can bend them in magnitude if you properly bend it in time. Um, so kicking the can down the road, which has terribly negative connotations, is really not that negative at all. The question really is how long is your road? And if you run out of road, you're in deep doo-doo. Um, if, you, if you don't run out of road, kicking a can down the road gives you time to fix the problem. Where I'm starting to come increasingly into Kyle's camp and, and criticize my own support of policy is we're running out of road. Um, and, and I also believe, as I said at the end of the last session, and this is the question for Kyle, that financial markets 
don't signal very well to the users of policy and makers of policy how long their road is. And when they're fed up with giving you road, they take it away rapidly and the end comes very quickly. Um, so my question to you, Kyle, is do you agree with what I just said? I think you do. But how do you look at the road today and our ability to kick the can down? And let's start in the United States. Let's, let's stay right here at home for a bit. Um, how long do we have, and someone at the break said kicking the can down the road is the wrong analogy. Maybe it's taking off on the runway, and that's right, because we are looking for GDP growth. So take off is kind of a, a better um, analogy. But how long do we have? Do we have much more of a road? I, like, I think we have, uh, well, let's say the, the political elite think that we have 10 years, and I think we have three to five, and it's, and it's predicated on the acceleration of what happens in Europe and Japan. And the chronology of events is very important to get right if you're an asset manager, um, oh, not so much if you're a member of the public. Absolutely, asset uh, managers go you know, illiquid or go bankrupt before right. they can recognize the profit. Um, but that, that slip that you talk about, and you talked about a little bit in the last session when you talked about the magic wand, it's the, the reason people have such a hard time thinking this through uh, is it doesn't forward anyone's self-interest if you start thinking of the different iterative concepts that we're talking about here. Um, it doesn't point to a, a great outcome. It either points to a really bad outcome or, a, or just a nominally bad outcome um, or negativity. And, and again, human beings by nature are generally optimistic. The psychology of this uh, environment is much more important than the quantitative analysis. The quantitative analysis, you, you, know, you need to be rooted in that and then you need to understand the politics and the psychology of it all. Um, and, and just case in point, think back to Lehman. When, um, when Lehman was about to go broke, seven days before they went down, uh, you had Paulson telling you uh, that he wasn't going to save them in, in no more words than one. And he was very specific. And yet, Lehman senior secured bonds were trading 400 basis points over treasuries one week before they went down. The day before they went down, they traded 704 basis points over treasuries. The very next trading day, they were worth eight cents. You lost 92 points. Why? Because we have been conditioned to believe that there's always this savior out there. I mean, hell, you worked in one of the institutions that Keynes founded that was this optical backstop designed to make everyone believe that countries can't default. They have a balance of payments problem. There'll be the IMF there to save them. Well, now all of a sudden, the optics of the backstops are coming into question. And there isn't money there. It's just promises to borrow and lend. And so. This, this psychology and this gap between what we want to believe is going to happen and what does happen is enormous. And it's where we stand today. And it's where we stand today on Greece, on Italy. Um, I think it's really important to think through that psychology. And again, the collective behavior of the participants is what causes these things to happen. And so the psychology is very important to understand. Do you think we need, you heard, you heard the last session also talk about globalization and what it means. I, I'm actually optimistic globalization will continue, but the path between here and a better place could be a really bad place. Yeah, I mean, look, globalization will continue, but look, there are periods in time in which the globe has severe difficulty. And um, we live with this dissonance that we believe we, so I, I think unabated free trade is problematic for the country that has the highest living standards and highest nominal wages in the world. Call, I mean, call me crazy. Because you move to the middle. Well, look, we yeah, you think that you think that you can Im import the good, right? The deflation from the world's factory floors and lowest wages places, and you can leave the bad behind. Their standards of living and their their wages. And what we're seeing now is um, that's not the case. It's not the case at all. What you're seeing now is we have permanent job loss, and the Fed is just starting to, to recognize this. If you saw in the last Fed report, they they adjusted their long-term unemployment number up two tenths of a point. I mean, it's a baby step, right? But when you ask Fed, uh, Fed presidents, um, what they think the secular unemployment number is, um, they, they all think it's less than 100 basis points. And I'd argue that it's hundreds of basis points. Yeah, we used to challenge the Fed on some of their assumptions. Macroeconomists have a wonderful way of just projecting models out for many, many years. Yeah. And current models have off the charts productivity growth from the 90s. And we're still projecting productivity growth in this country from a 1995, 1997 level into the 220s, 2020s. It's just pretty amazing. So therefore, GDP bails out everything. We're going look, to be okay. We're not, look, we're not going to grow. We, if we grow, we're going to grow very slowly. Debt in the world has grown from, and I have these in slides, but it's difficult to get to these slides. Um, 
let's try let's try to get here. The U.S. slides are up front, I think. Okay. If they can move it forward. Okay. Craig, can you move we'll, it we'll forward? Do it. There we go. Try try to find Next. the debt the debt slide while I'm talking about it. Look, global debt has gone from eighty trillion dollars. This is global credit market debt in nineteen. Um, so that was in nineteen. I'm oh, sorry, two thousand two, and and that's U.S. Keep moving forward, please. Um, They've gone from $8 trillion to $210 trillion. So think about this. Debt has grown in the last nine years, it's grown at a 12% annual growth rate, while GDP has grown at four. So what do you expect when you have a pillar of the world community, the European Union, when you have them uh, entering a, a prolonged stage of deleveraging? Well, the rest of the world, in the absence of private credit demand, isn't going to grow. If we grow, our hope is that we grow at one, one and a half. Right, that's, that's, that's our, in my opinion, that's our And hope. that doesn't do anything for employment. Well, look, anything under, anything really under 225 has, has unemployment, or un, has in, unemployment going higher, employment going lower. Um, so it's my assertion that our, our only hope is to, is to plot along, but I, I don't think that's the case either. So if policy is meant to buy time in order to find growth and an adjustment of some sort, including writing down debt, because we have way too much debt, I would argue we can't write down the debt today because we can't afford to write it all you down. You can never afford to write it down, Todd. I mean, give, give me a break. <laughs> but if we're taking the, here's, this slide is a wonderful slide. Thanks. Because if, basically we tried to buy time over the last 15 years with a lot of our problems. Look how poorly we spent our borrowed money. The bottom line is the bill is due today. The bill is due in Europe today. It's due in Japan tomorrow. It's due in the US the next day. And those days are, are separated by years, of course and um, no one wants to admit it. Yeah, I saw everyone in here talk, talking about Greece. It's interesting now that a big conference in Austin, Texas can opine <laughs> on the solvency of a, of a nation like Greece. Uh, because in a very democratic way. In a very democratic <laughs> way. Um, it, but when you think about Greece, what does, what does, what does, what does solvency mean to you? Right? What, it, what is debt sustainability as we define it today? I define it in a kind of very numerical way. Um, I define it as the ratings agencies define it, and they define it as um, having a sustainable debt load uh, means that you're not spending more than 10% of your central government revenue on interest, right? And the U.S. is almost there. Uh, but Greece spends 16% of central government revenue on interest alone. And does anyone know what their on balance sheet financing cost is? Does anyone in here know the number? Forget their market rates. Everyone knows those numbers today. What, are they, what does it really cost them today for their weighted average cost of capital on balance sheet. Does anybody know? That's interesting. We all know they're in trouble. We all know they're going to default. We're, just, we're pretty sure of that. But no one looks at the numbers. They borrow at 4.4%. Their two-year money is 100% cost, and their 10-year money is 27%. They borrow at 4 and they're spending 16% on interest. For those of you that think a 50-cent default on the private sector, is what's gonna fix Greece, you've lost your mind. It is a full write down of what the, EC, what the Troika doesn't own. The Troika owns 40% of their debt. We're talking about the other 200 billion euros. If you just do the math, you realize it is a full wipeout. Can you explain really quickly what Troika means? Yeah, it's the IMF, right, the ECB, and, the, and the, really the EU. I'm, I'm asking because this, this is a housing finance audience too, so I just wanna make sure but everybody understands. It's the collection of optical backstops that has acquired 40% of Greece's outstanding sovereign debt. And their rates are still at all time highs. So how, how soon do you think Greek will default? Okay, so don't hold me to this, but I'll give you my opinion. Um, the next tranche, let's assume they, so first of all, they have to get the next tranche. Greece is, runs a huge current account deficit, runs a huge fiscal deficit, and they have no FX reserve. They are completely broke. I mean, you, they literally have nowhere to go right now. So they need this 8.8 .8 billion euros. They have uh, maturities that begin December 19th and end December 30th that are 8 billion euros. So if you think about this PSI solution, they're trying to get the banks to take a 50 cent write down. And then there are other pensions, insurance companies, and private sector holders that own the balance of the debt. Well, when December 19th comes, and they have a billion euros in maturities, uh, what do they do with the holdouts? What do they do with the people that haven't signed up for the PSI solution? Do they pay them par or do they wipe them out? I can't imagine the Troika paying a hedge fund par, but maybe it'll happen. Um, 
I think that day is the day where they have to make a decision. And that's why you see them really pushing for things to be done in November. I think they know it. How, how many people will hold out, though? Being, that, being in that minority, and I don't, I'm, I'm hesitant to use that phrase because it assumes there's a majority that accept, and it probably will be, but being in a minority is a scary place when you have that December 19 conversation. Yeah, I'm, I'm just telling you, the, it, so in the 21 cent PV solution, that was the prior right, solution, right. They, had not, they didn't even have a 70% uptake in, in the IAF. So now we're going to double, more than double but that was hit. But that was a PV hit, right? This is a face hit right. for 50 cents. I mean, look, it's, this is all a joke. In the end, they have to write it all down. And it's a full wipeout of what the Troika doesn't own. On the Troika, real quickly, too, one thing to, to pay attention to, sort of a subtlety that jumped out at me in the last week, is EU goes on bended knee to China. China says, maybe we will help you. Um, Brazil bails out China in the conversation, in my opinion, by s jumping in and saying, well, we're interested in supporting Europe and maybe other developed market countries that run into problems, but we don't want to do it directly. We want to do it through the IMF. So for me, at least, that's code word for United States and Europe and Japan. You're going to give up votes at the IMF. You're going to give up power at the IMF. And so our new world order is going to be much more balanced in a G20 emerging market sense. I, I gave someone the picture in Europe of, I think you're going to have the IMF with a bunch of emerging markets behind them saying, here's the check, but you have to do X. And Europe says, OK. And they go, no, 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 you got to do X. And they just keep, they're going to really hold these guys feet to the fire. And it's going to be a new world for a lot of G7, G10 guys when Brazil and China start calling the shots on lending from the IMF. So that's, that's a, that'll be a change. Well, so no disrespect to you, Todd. Um, <laughs> I think, but you have before. I think when you, um, when you really think about what's being said, if you study the proposal from the BRICS to the IMF, the $350 billion number is a really interesting number if you um, think about what kinds of um, percentage votes that, to your, to your point, changes the votes, changes the balance of power within the IMF. Um, it actually takes our veto away from us. Yes. That, that's the key, right? We form the IMF. So if you think, about, think back to the formation of this great institution you used to work for, um, it was a natural evolution of the Keynesian ideology, where in 1940, uh, we just went through a period of time in which 48% of the world's nations restructured their sovereign obligations in the late 30s. And so this guy named Keynes from the UK and this guy named White from the United States said, maybe we should put together this institution where everyone contributes some capital and they have a rainy day fund. And if they ever have a balance of payments problem, uh, we can borrow from the rainy day fund and pay it back later to once we solve our our, right, our primary deficit problems. Um, well, if you really read about the history of IMF, this is what's interesting. Um, in my opinion, it was put together to solve small balance of payments issues for small countries. And when it gets to even a medium-sized country, it doesn't work. And former IMF chief, chief economists that have become friends of mine agree with this. Um, but it, 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 you remember the history of White from the US? Yep. So White was at the US Treasury. You remember what happened to him? At the Treasury? No, yeah. So, so when Keynes and White got together in 1940 and then put the IMF together in 44, it turns out White was a Russian spy. <laughs> and the whole time he was at Treasury. And he was brought before the Un-American Crimes Unit, and then he killed himself. Right. Um, so therefore, never proven. That's how you think about the formation of the IMF itself. It was kind of funny. Um, and you know, White ended up giving the Russians printing plates, and they printed US dollars to grow, from, uh, grow out of the World War II mess. So anyway, it's a very interesting beginning for such a great institution. If you, can you get to the IMF slide? Um, what's the guy's name again? Can you move oh, forward? Right. To, there's an IMF slide that has a, uh, a chart and, a, and a, has both a bar chart and a pie chart on it. Keep moving. Can you not control from here? But I like no. that other slide about how leverage is shifted. I, wanna get, I want you to get to the IMF slide. There's the debt slide, if you back up one. This is the Kager of global, global growth. Now, again, here's, here's, a, here's the key issue. Total credit market debt to GDP in the world is approaching 340%. We've never been there before. And what's important to understand about that is any time you've gotten anywhere near that in the past, what's happened is both side, there have been two sides entering a conflict. And both sides deficit spend going into the conflict. And to the victor go the spoils. And to the loser goes defeat and default. And the reason why we're having such a hard time understanding what's going on today is there isn't a playbook for this. This is the largest peacetime accumulation of debt in world history. 
so we don't know how this is going to end. And you talked about the social fabric being ruffled. Um, it may be torn. And what does that mean? How does, what is it? Well, let, let me ask it in a bigger question. And someone else threw a question up here, which I want us to get back to as well. And that's, Darn, just when it was getting interesting. That's, that's some of the housing issues too. So put, I know that you do a lot of fundamental research and then you mm -hmm. sit back and really question yourself and challenge yourself. Mm -hmm. And then you take the show on the road and go talk to policymakers directly mm -hmm. and say, here's my concern, tell me why it shouldn't be a concern. Mm -hmm. When you go to Washington, D.C. and you have that conversation, how does that conversation play out and how do they think about jobs and housing? So one of the most important people with regard to housing has been Barney Frank, right? So when I met with Barney and I asked him where the hundred billion was coming from that we gave to the IMF last, he said, Kyle, you and I both know it's just a journal entry, it's not real money. I said, well, shit, Barney, if it's not real money, let's give him three trillion. Let's make it count. <laughs> and he says, well, I can't give him three trillion. I'll give him a hundred billion, then we can get it to a trillion now. I mean, what he was saying to me once I, once I got, uh, once I calmed down a little bit, um, <laughs> I think what he was trying to say to me was, again, it's optics, it'll never be drawn, right? It's a commitment, it's not a funding issue today. We'll commit this, we're trying to generate this bazooka of a trillion dollars notionally for the IMF, it'll never be drawn. Um, so the other thing I heard from policymakers recently is when I'm talking to them about a potential bond crisis in the United States and extending our duration and making the right decisions today, they say, well, what are you talking about? The 10 years at 2%, we don't have a crisis. I said, shit, I gotta go. I just need to leave here. Because <laughs> that is, I leave there demoralized every time I go, but that, that's what they're saying, right? They're driving the race car with the rearview mirror. Right. They'll only react to a crisis, and, and they're about to have one. So I guess that's the silver lining of what we're talking about. But you do go further than that. You've told me about conversations where you've had very, very good detailed conversations with the likes of Treasury and the Fed yeah. and, and Capitol Hill. So. Describe for, describe for us how that policy argument goes and give us the pros and the cons. Where, how can we get ourselves back on the right track? Should we just all go home and, and you know, buy no, property I mean, in Montana? Look, or? It's really clear what we should do, right? We have a spending problem. It doesn't take a Democrat or a Republican or a Libertarian to figure out that we're spending 26% of GT, GDP and we're bringing in 16. So we need to bring revenues up about two and a half points and we need to bring expenses down five points. I mean, it's that easy. Well, it's not that easy. Right, so the policy is, here, here's what we don't talk about. Uh, if we bring in 2.4, 2.5 trillion in revenue, you, you think about the three buckets of the, of the how many of you in here have read the CBO report cover to cover? I'd love to see, anyone? No, oh, that's interesting too. So my wife thinks I'm boring now, but I read it a lot. Uh, <laughs> There are, three, there are three buckets that I think about, right? There is, there is uh, the man, what, they, what they deem to be mandatory spending, which of course are all the transfer payments. That's Medicare, A through D, Social Security, food stamps. It's everything that they kind of have to pay. Uh, and, then, and then it's defense and non-defense discretionary. Those are the three buckets. Our, our bucket that is mandatory is almost 100% of central government tax revenue. So the other two are our deficit, right? Defense, non-defense discretionary. So if we're talking about cutting, where do you want to cut? Well, the mandatory bucket's growing at almost 10% a year. Like you look at the CAGR of these different line items and you know, well, our GDP is growing at two and these are growing at eight or nine. You know, I know which ones I need to fix, but those are impossible at the moment. Uh, so where else are you going to cut? I guess my hope is that the debt super committee doesn't come to a conclusion which is more likely what, it's, what likely. it's looking like, right. which is great because these automatic mechanisms to cut spending on defense, non-defense discretionary are across the board. Maybe that's what both sides need to really enact true cuts today so that no one can throw a rock or stick them with an arrow for voting for it. Um, although in the past, sequestration and automatic cuts have never worked. Right. They just move the goalposts. So I hope that doesn't happen. Uh, exactly. That's what I was going to ask you. So a big question from the financial markets, particularly folks in Europe lately, has been, um, as this super committee plays out, exactly as you say, it's, the bet is they won't come up with any grand plan. Will people move the goalpost? Will we water down the teeth in failure to do anything? Yeah, um, with, you were just in Europe. When we talk with the Europeans, um, they say that the US, the US is so much worse off than Europe. This is what we're hearing now. We're, we're hearing the fingers pointing like right. this. Um, and, and what they're, the people that are in denial in Europe are not realizing that we've recapped our banking system, right? We had a trillion of equity and 15 trillion of assets here 
and through capital injections of both preferred and common, we've injected 882 billion. We've literally recapped almost every dime of equity in our banking system. Uh, and now we have decent loss reserves and, and uh, pretty, pretty slowly non-performing loans. Where in Europe, they never recapped anything. The UK did, Europe didn't. And the European banks are three times as levered as the US banks are. So post recap of the European banking system, they are infinitely worse off than we are on balance sheet, including Germany. Mm -hmm. So I think, again, there's a divide between uh, reality and belief in Europe that uh, is going to sink Europe before we sink. Housing. Yep. Let's go back to two questions on housing. What do you hear from Capitol Hill, this country, about housing policy? Uh, okay. And second question, uh, it's often wrapped up in an assumption on Capitol Hill, is that international capital flows will continue to support U.S. housing markets. Yes, we may have to fix the GSE model. Yes, we may have to fix securitization. But once we sort of get that sorted out, which is going to be easy with one of our magic wands, the capital flows will continue again. Yeah, I'm not sure I buy that. But I am, I am more, um, look, we've, so the way I think about housing, I think in, in the last um, 30, 40 years, there have been 23 housing busts in OECD nations. And um, when you look at these busts, the typical peak to trough in home price depreciation has taken six years. And in the big five, where there have been banking crises, it's taken eight. And the majority of the declines happen in the first three quarters of that kind of separation. So I'd argue that housing here peaked in Q4 of 06. We're in Q4 of 2011. Um, so I think we're five years in. I think we have two or three years left. And, but those two or three years are, are really um, a bottoming out. So I don't anticipate a huge decline in housing from here, even another 10%. I don't think that's likely. Okay, so if you look ahead 10 years, well, let's, let's play this game. If you look ahead five to 10 years, what does the housing market here look like? Can people, um, some of the early evidence on the echo boom, to think of demographics again, is that while they're forming families at the same pace of previous generations, mm -hmm. they're not buying homes. They've obviously learned the lesson of the last five years and said, when I was 22, things blew up. Now that I'm 27 and I'm married, I'm not so sure I want to go dive into that world quite yet. Mm. But does that change? Does, is, does, does housing become an investment again, or is it truly a consumable? And, and how do we fix the housing model in this country, in your opinion? That's a big question. That's a big question. It's a big question for a non-housing guy. I just kind of read about it. You have been, a, I mean, you played in, you, you, you've, you've yeah, been yeah. involved in the mortgage market. Yeah, we have an opinion, but we're not an expert in the, in the space. I don't yeah, think. you moved from subprime lending to subprime sovereigns. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was an easy path to follow, I think. <laughs> um, I, think, I, think uh, I think the housing market, just like anything, will end up doing well again. Um, I don't know particularly about the echo boomers. I, we kind of see 8 million homes in inventory. Uh, a healthy inventory number is two to two and a half million homes. I think absorption is somewhere around a million and a half homes a year, uh, even with echo boomers not necessarily buying new homes. Mm -hmm. I, the people I run into um, aren't, aren't great evidence for your theory. And, and again, maybe mine's a microcosm of the world. They are still buying homes. They're buying they homes. Um, government's 90% of the housing market. They have to stay there, uh, I think, for a while. And I think we had a great conversation at breakfast about this. The government clearly didn't charge enough for the guarantee, right? I mean, the GSEs were charging 20 basis points for their G fee. Full cycle losses will be about 325 basis points, we think. So 20 basis points wasn't enough. So we need to raise the G fee, right? I mean, that isn't that hard. We need to take the G fee from 20 to 70. Is that a disaster? No. If we do it slowly, it's not a disaster. It's a great thing. Um, and that, at some point in time, will invite private sector participation again. Yeah. I mean, but we still have to have a massive deleveraging. True. Right? The only deleveraging that's gone on in our country is six or seven points of the, of the consumer balance sheet, and that was all through forced deleveraging through foreclosure. Mm -hmm. And the government's relevered more than we've delevered. So, you know, ha there's this great paper that I think all of you should read. Uh, it's one of the best things I've read in the last two years. It's called The Black Swan of Cairo, and it was written for the Council on Foreign Relations. And in it, it talks about the smoothing of volatility and mm. heavy-handed dictatorial regimes, but the analogies you can draw to all kinds of different, um, call it asset classes, marketplaces, countries, are, it's, you'll start to connect the dots as you read it. It's only about eight or nine pages long, but it's really well-written. Let's go global for a minute. Talk about um, Japan. 
and give us an update. You talked about Japan a lot last year. Wait, wait, wait. Before we go to Japan, can we go back to Greece? Sure. Real quick. So what happens when Greece defaults? What's that look like? Um, so then, then we'll get to Japan. Again, that goes back to the qualitative uh, inputs of the participants. Right? Up until even today, people believe that a developed Western sovereign can't restructure, that the risk-free rate is the risk-free rate, even though rates are already telling you, as one participant, I think it was Josh, said they've already, for all intents and purposes, restructured. Um, you know, they haven't yet. We haven't had a developed Western sovereign restructure since World War II. As soon as they do, you have to think about the, the qualitative um, analysis of the participants changing. And if it just changes on the margin um, for countries like Japan or countries like Italy, which is happening daily, um, then the dominoes start falling. And as the dominoes start falling, you're going to see, in, I know you'd like to see an orderly process here. I've never seen an orderly default process. So I think it's going to be a forest fire. And when it is, um, the dominoes are going to fall. And our job as fiduciaries is to not lose the money. This isn't the end of the world, right? It just means a lot of people are going to lose a lot of money. And it's your job to not be one of them. It's definitely my job to not be one of them. Um, and so that's how I constantly I wake up at night. I constantly think, are we positioned properly for this? Um, so the, the, the way that I think about it is those dominoes start falling. The participants in Japan, we've pulled the Japanese people. Um, and I think culturally, we're going to get this right. Um, I feel terrible for them, but they're going to lose a third of their savings and they're going to have a big problem in their bond market. And when that happens, um, what do you do with a per population where a third of the population is already over the age of 60 and 25% is already over the age of 65? And you have the most xenophobic society in the world. Japan is going to be the biggest problem the world faces. So, you're, uh, so you said something which I, sh I think is absolutely right early on about time matters. Fundamental analysis, a lot of people can get right. Mm -hmm. Even market analysis, a lot of people can get right. Timing is what distinguishes good asset managers and mediocre asset managers. What's the timing of some uh, of these events? We've been mediocre You, you, you wake up in the middle of the night, I bet it's more about timing than it is a lot of things. You know, it's more about the social fabric of the world. Well, I mean, talk about that. If we're right about this, I mean, like, what, what does this all mean? If you talk to an economic historian, it just means war. Who does it mean war between? I don't know who it means war between, but I have, a, I have an opinion as to where the war will be. Uh, but it, 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 what this means is a very difficult period of time for the world. This is not a cyclical rebound from a crisis that we had two years ago, and you should be buying stocks because the P-E ratio is low, uh, comparatively speaking, with the rest of the S&P years, because the E is wrong. And we're going to see declines, and people don't know how to position themselves for declines. Are we and seeing peak earnings right now? Earnings are looking good. Yeah. If you take all the bad assets and put it on the public balance sheet, earnings are going to look good. <laughs> so and peak earnings, we're, we're seeing peak earnings? Yeah, I mean, this is what's just happened. We're high-fiving ourselves for TARP. Sorry, Jeb, I know you, know you were part of the TARP, and he's a good friend of mine. But I mean, if, if we print enough money, uh, anyone can make TARP work. Right? You pay ourselves back with the money we print and throw it through the banks. I mean, it's, we're high-fiving, and we're like, well, I mean, we can just keep printing and make that work. Uh, but I think going forward, we haven't solved any problems. Nothing's delevered. And now you're starting to see marginal delevering in Europe, and all hell's breaking loose. Yeah. So there are two things that popped up on our questions, which one of which I was hoping we could do too, and that is I'd like to see, they would like to see Kyle go through some of his slides and some of the analysis, and that's what, I agree with that, but we're having a hard time making that work. Can we do that? And we can do it in the context of Japan, um, and I'll tell you why, because I think when you go through Kyle's story on Japan, you'll see both similarities to the U.S. and good news, dissimilarities to the U.S., and, and maybe you can point some of those out as you do it. Yep. Very, very quickly. Last year, we talked a lot about the, the sequence. So if one country falls and sovereign defaults happen in clusters, before, how do we get to Japan from Greece? Um, again, the, the participants' beliefs change in the margin, and all they have to do is change in the margin. And I'll, I'll explain to you why. Okay. Um, I know there's a question as to whether de Tocqueville said that. We can't figure it out. Um, this is on balance sheet. There are a few things that are indisputable, right? The indisputable arguments are the quantitative analysis. On balance sheet, Japan has the worst um, sovereign balance sheet in the world, and that's indisputable. What, what is disputable, uh, or that's open to question, is the qualitative inputs and your beliefs as to why it can be this high and why it can maintain this kind of level of indebtedness. Uh, at the end of this year, it'll be 227% gross. I guess um, 
I don't know if you, those of you in the back can see this. Again, this is more another qualitative point that I want to make. Uh, six months ago, Italy was one of the pillars of the European Union. You never heard anything about Italy. No, there was no problems in Italy six months ago. They went from essentially sacrosanct to a complete crisis. Why? Because their 10-year rates went from 5% to 6%. Now, does that make you feel great about the debt loads of the world, that 100 basis points can take you uh, from, from being a perfect, solid pillar of the community to a complete crisis? Well, I'm just talking about 20 years of pro-cyclicality and add, adding on these debt burdens generate a scenario in which your debts get to be many multiples of your revenue. And as soon as that happens, you have a nonlinear relationship develop. So when the cost of your debt moves at all, you go into crisis mode. And just this morning, Italy, uh, Italy two years north of 630, uh, the, the EFSF bonds came to the marketplace at 104 basis points over mid swaps. The EFSF facility priced 40 basis points wider than France. Okay? Nobody showed up to buy it. This was their second attempt. Well, that's a shock that no one showed up to buy that bond. Uh, the, the point I want to make, um, you know, we, we developed a finance minister index um, that, you know, in theory, um, if we're right about the aging of the Japanese people and the on-balance sheet problems that they have and, and the, the wall they're facing, um, they've had nine finance ministers in five years. If you go back through the Fed, the last 10 Fed presidents will take you back to the 1930s. Um, so let me go, let me, I'm going to go through some of my empirical work. This is new stuff, so I didn't bring our actual Japan uh, piece that I brought last year. Yep. Um, we'll go through a few of the salient characteristics of Japan. What, why did Bernie Madoff fail so horribly? There was only one reason, right? He had more people leave his scheme than enter. It was that simple. You only need one thing when you're running a Ponzi scheme, and it's, and it's more inflows than outflows. And it really boils down to that one issue. So we all know in here that we can't afford to pay Social Security or Medicare A through D, right? I mean, we all realize the numbers just don't work. But we don't worry about it today because we still have a growing population. We still have more dummies entering than exiting. And as long as you have that one characteristic in place, uh, I think that you can perpetuate a scheme for a long time. I know Governor Perry called Social Security a Ponzi scheme. He called it what it is. I know it's difficult to discuss it that way. Uh, but it, what you realize is when that, when, the, when that one characteristic changes, when more people exit than enter, the rubber meets the road, you have to live up to promises that you can't live up to, and it detonates the scenario. So in Japan, they peaked in population three and a half years ago at about 128 million people. The most recent census has them at 125 million people. So they've lost almost three million people in the last three and a half years. So when the population curve in Japan, by their own numbers, they think there'll be sub-100 million people by 2050. So that's less than 40 years from now. Mm -hmm. So you have the most xenophobic society in the world. Less than 1 million of the 125 are non-Japanese. So centrally planned didn't work. And um, what are they going to do? Let the Chinese in? They hate the Chinese. What they, they can't let the South Koreans in? They hate the South Koreans. They're throwing the Brazilians out that helped them rebuild Japan. So you have this scenario where the numbers aren't going to work anymore. You have more people leaving than entering uh, their social safety net, social benefit scheme. And you have this scenario where government revenues are doing nothing but declining. And so when you look at the population of Japan and you look at all of the inputs, the output says uh, that the rubber meets the road. Do we, um, does the United States have any concerns in that area? No, we still have about eight-tenths of a point of population growth. We still allow illegal and legal immigration, and uh, we still allow those people to work in our society. Uh, we still have net formations of households. Right. The immigration issue is considered a big difference between us and Japan. Yeah. Um, our whole philosophy there now. Post 9-11, we've revisited that. Um, I've also heard some sort of the think tank crowd in Washington start to say, if we start to run into some of these social fabric issues, what's it going to mean for immigration? I'm not an immigration expert, but I, I would, um, my advice is to adopt a policy like Australia has. Um, we don't need the, in my opinion, let's say we need to monitor, I don't mean to upset anyone here, but we need to monitor the low end of the immigrants that are coming in here, and we need to put a finite number on them and put walls up. Uh, but on the, on the other side, uh, in Australia, if you, if you are willing to invest a million dollars of capital in the Australian uh, business marketplace and hire Australians and set up a business there, you get a passport. 
That's a pretty good idea. Canada's doing the same thing and right. even providing tax breaks. And you know, maybe maybe we should, um, you know, run through TSA who these people are so we don't get the wrong people here. But you know, there there is a way I think to amend immigration policy to make it work and this make is, it better for us. This is an interest. This is a scary sort of area, of, in a social political sense. Uh, and believe it or not, a country that's often seen as being incredibly open, France, is the one that's stirring the pot in a number of the G worlds. Um, they're actually trying to do what you just hinted at, and that is they're trying to measure GDP contribution of immigration and upgrade the quality of immigration. It's that's too, it's too late. Very it's difficult, too late for them. Very difficult process, very difficult process. So um, another question that's come up, and, it, and I, I want to make sure we get there, is we paint a pretty bad scenario. I mean, let's not, let's not beat around the bush. Uh, a very worrying scenario, including for ourselves. What do you do with your money? If, I mean, if you're- yeah, I think if you're the individual, um, what you should do is be much more conservative than you even think you need to be. I mean, return of capital is much more important in the next <laughs> few years than return on capital. And that's, we're not programmed that way as Americans. We all think the central bank and government will get it right, things will go up and everything will be fine. And, I think in, in the environment that we're talking about here, believe it or not, the U.S. dollar is going to be fine if we're in the short to medium term if we're right about Europe and Japan um, from that Pavlovian response from scared money coming here. So I think you should be more in cash and hanging on to productive assets and less invested in financial assets. It's, it's really that simple. What does productive assets mean, though? That's a pretty I mean, broad you know, own oil wells or you own apartment buildings. Real you, things. Yeah, you, you productive things. Income earning, productive, yeah, real but, things. Yeah, but I'm not saying that you won't suffer market market losses there if we're right about deleveraging, but at least it'll be uh, keeping up with any kind of debasement of the, of the currency over time. Um, wait, Kyle, can you talk a little bit about gold? And why at Utimco, I, I, why at Utimco you actually took delivery of the actual gold? So I'll give you my opinion. I won't speak on, on behalf of Utimco. Sure. So my opinion is um, very simple as a fiduciary which I am in that position, um, it, to the extent that you own uh, gold and you um, are going to own it for a long time, it's not a trade, it, it costs us about 90 basis points a year to roll it through financial futures contracts. And then uh, we went and looked at the COMEX. So the COMEX at the time had about $80 billion of open interest between futures and futures options. And um, in the warehouse, they had 2.7 billion of deliverables. So 80 billion of open interest, 2.7 billion of deliverables. We're gonna own it a long time. You're on the board, you're a fiduciary, what do you do? Like that's an easy one, you, get, you go get it, All right? So you go take a billion of the 2.7 billion and let them worry about the rest. Mm -hmm. And when I talked to the head of deliveries for Comex and IMEX, I said, well, what if, you know, what if like 4% of the people want delivery? And he says, oh, Kyle, that never happens. Um, you know, we, 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 we rarely ever get a 1% delivery. So, um, and I said, well, what if it does happen? And he says, well, price will solve everything. I said, thanks, give me the gold. <laughs> you know. um, and, me, and, and then what was interesting was um, we conducted an audit and, of the delivery. Um, and what was interesting in the audit was they kind of resisted our uh, audit request on the front end. And then they finally allowed us in. And um, we did a random audit there of, we had like 1,600 bars or something like that. And we just wanted to see 20 or 30 of them. And um, they were all over the place in different venues in, in the vault that weren't segregated. So yeah, it's, it's an interesting concept. But what I'm saying is <laughs> the, um, the exchange is a fractional reserve exchange and they think price will solve everything. So yeah. I mean, that was a decision. It's actually an easy decision if you're a fiduciary. A couple questions have come up about our alluding to social unrest. Um, as you just said, I was in Europe last week, and believe it or not, I had people asking me about the AARP ad that came out a week or two ago. People in Europe commenting about our AARP ad. I didn't see ad. it. Basically, it shows a gentleman standing in front of um, some trees, but as you back up, there are thousands of people standing there to give you the impression of this is a lot of us. And they're basically saying, um, don't mess around with our entitlement program. Um, we have a lot of votes. And so people were asking, are you guys getting ready for one heck of a big generational war in the United States? Sure. So we've been alluding to social unrest. What do you mean by that? Well, I, look, the, the, off -all, the Occupy Wall Streeters have a, um, they have a case, in my opinion, on, on the side of the banks. I mean, 
what on earth, Jeb, what on earth were we doing um, in investing um, equity, uh, uh, US government, taxpayer money into bank equities? I mean, that was the biggest bozo no-no of that last um, um, debacle that we went through. You have to, you, there, you, you said, do we have to change in your last session, do we have to change the, the way the capitalist model works? Well, if we really had a capitalist model, right, we'd have some bankruptcy. Capitalism <coughs> without bankruptcy yeah. is like, right, uh, you know the old saying. Um, I think from the perspective of today, uh, maybe we'll tr draw the line somewhere differently. And uh, we need to just wipe out capital structures, right? We need to wipe out equity, we need to wipe out sub debt, and maybe we, the government backs the senior debt but still haircuts the original owners so that there is some loss with, with their regard to their investment. Um, so I think the social unrest is going to continue to grow. I wouldn't discount the Occupy Wall Street model because you have guys um, that have real credibility starting to back the movement, even though the movement doesn't have a real, uh, it doesn't have a, a titular head, it's kind of the multi-headed hydra. Mm -hmm. But as more and more people get involved and more and more kind of professors and educated folks get involved with the movement, I think, I think a head will kind of show up there and it'll be a bigger problem. Do you think that the, the budget cuts will trigger that in, in a much worse direction than just a bunch of people holding up signs? The, and the bottom line is, Tony, we either take a lot of pain now or we take apocalyptic pain later. That's the answer. But and that's Todd's magic wand. But in an election year, how much time do we have to take the pain? And in a democracy, will people actually vote for it? Yeah, so I think, I right think we just continue to print money, actually, is the answer. And then what? Then you're in big trouble. Well, hang on, step back for a minute. Let's push on that. Let, let, me, <laughs> let, me, let, me push, let me push back a bit. You're in charge. You're in charge of this thing called the United States government slash budget, and it gives you political and fiscal authority to do, quote unquote, the right thing. Yeah. Would you mark to market balance sheets today and create the economic downside that that would follow, or would you put in place or attempt to put in place some kind of economic policies to get you to a better place down some theoretical road? I mean, how do you solve a problem where you're spending 10% of, you know, you're running a 10% fiscal deficit? You're not going to get growth in the absence of private sector credit demand. So the government's idea right now is we're gonna export our way out of this. And yeah. when I asked a senior member of the Obama administration last week, how are we going to grow exports if we won't allow nominal wage deflation. And he says, we're just gonna kill the dollar. And I said, okay, more you mean. Um, so that, I mean, that's the only answer. And you, it, that's a dead answer. It, it's a dead answer, but it's the, that's, where, that's where we're headed. So if you made me the czar, what would I do? I'd go, I'd go out there and I'd try to cut a bunch of things. And GDP would drop and unemployment would go up and I'd be the persona non grata. But it would be the right decision for our country for the next 10 years but it's gonna be really tough. And then, look, in 2008, our GDP only dropped 4%. We pretended that didn't even happen. The brevity of financial memory is only a couple of years. Yeah. We're, we're through that. It should have dropped 10 or 12%. So Unemployment should have gone a lot higher. We should have delevered, but we didn't. And now we're left where we are, now we are where we are today. The zero lower bound is the Keynesian endpoint. You can't afford to move from there. What, what Bernanke means to say when he says rates are gonna stay low for a couple of years, what he means to say is forever. He can't move them. Every point he moves them from there, it adds $140 billion of interest expense. You can't do it. You can't move it. So a Japanese solution has been, I'd rather go through, I'm, I'm gr grotesquely summarizing, I'd rather go through 10 or 20 years of no economic growth than put society through significant short-term pain. You agree with that? Yeah. I mean, and, and so you're saying we should go through significant short-term pain which means what does short term mean and how deep is the pain? Do you, do you have estimations on that? Uh, no, I'm not. But I that's mean, magic, I'm, that's important, that isn't talented. it? That's important. If you're, if you're sitting in Mr. Obama's seat, you can't, take a, you can't be relaxed about those two words. Yeah. How short term, those two questions. How short term and how much pain? I mean, maybe he should go ask Tim Geithner. He's been good so far. Nick, close your ears. <laughs> I mean, look, we're, we had the same people that brought us into this mess trying to bring us out of it. I mean, it's kind of a, I mean, I don't know, it kind of makes us a laughing stock of the world, but 
Does it have to get worse before we can make it better? I mean, does it have to? I yes. Mean, is there a white swan event? I don't know. I, I can't find one. Do you know of one? You're dressed like one. No. <laughs> Swan in front, duck in the back. <laughs> so, so, so can we go back to one of these questions? Someone asked about a filing we just made. <laughs> On the insurance? Yeah. Yeah, I saw that too. So I know, I know this, is, this is a mortgage servicing uh, mortgage conference. Um, so we have made an investment recently. We just closed it Friday. Uh, we own almost 5% of Magic or Midget. Um, mm -hmm. Someone asked if that was a short-term thing or a long-term thing. Um, it, I think that you can see... Um, that the pig has moved through the python uh, in, in, in terms of U.S. housing losses, uh, going to the MIs, going to the government. If you, if, you do, if you just chart delinquencies and losses, it's a pretty easy thing to do. Um, and we believe that um, you know, everyone paints the, paints the MIs with a brush that since they took PMI down, uh, they're just gonna, they all underwrote the same kind of business. They're all going to go the way of the dodo. And I think, um, you know, PMI had a huge negative equity position. They had 46 times capital in force. And Midgic has a pretty big positive equity position. We think they're adequately reserved. We think that they'll be one of the last ones standing. I think, for those of you asking what to do with your money, take a little bit of it. Uh, and I think this is worth three to ten times over the next five years. And I think it's, even in a runoff, it's worth north of three bucks. It's trading at, I don't know, 250. Um, I think, we think that one's really interesting. And that's, we're in it for the long haul. We didn't buy more than 5% because they have a, um, yeah. a poison pill trying to maintain some net operating loss carry forwards. Um, and um, in, in the future, uh, you have to petition the board and ask them if, if they'll allow you to buy more than five. They're just trying to preserve a tax benefit there or else we would have bought more. Washington, in dealing with a lot of their fiscal issues, is going about as far around the beltway as you can to avoid the conversations of Freddie and Fannie and the GSEs because it has both a fiscal conversation and a social housing conversation. Um, in your conversations in Washington, and simply your opinion, or, or your opinion, what, how, do we, how do we move from where we are to a better situation vis-a-vis -vis the GSEs? I think if you start raising the G, like the Treasury has the authority to raise the fees on the GSEs to the G fees. Um, we think um, we think that if you get the G fee up from 20 to 70 basis points over over time, that um, the G the the GSEs will be able to pay back the Treasury uh, as well as um, be solvent again down the road. We think they'll lose um, call it 150 billion. Uh, will be full cycle losses full for cycle. the GSEs. Um, but the problem is both the Republicans and the Democrats want to put a bullet in the GSEs each one that we meet with. Yeah. And as you know, almost all the business is going to FHA today and the GSEs, the only per, by the way, the only people buying GSE bonds are the Fed. Uh, so I don't think international capital flows are coming back without an explicit guarantee and I don't think we can give an explicit guarantee. So I think they'll be in this, this um, homeostasis that they sit in for a long time and if you, if you kind of do a few things to amend the, the income statement there and raise the G fees a little bit, it's, uh, it'll work itself out. Um, a lot of that is not even financial. A lot of the typical public sector buyers of that kind of paper are more frightened by the headline risk and what's Capitol Hill going to do. Do you agree? Do you agree with that? Or would you restate headline risk? Is headline risk more important than economic risk in, when it comes to the GSEs right now? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think an overzealous politician. Do you trade is it at risk. all? We own the GSE preferreds. Yeah, a couple of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know. I think that when they, look, when they took the banks down, think about the difference, right? The GSEs are very similar to the banks. It's kind of public sector cap structure, or sorry, private sector cap structure, public sector implicit guarantee. Very similar to the banks. When they took the banks down, they charged the banks 5% interest. When they took the GSEs down, they charged them 10% interest. And what's interesting is when you're an auditor and you look at the banks and you're deciding whether or not to take a bank down or take it over, you look at the next year, right? You try to provision for losses one year out. In the GSEs, they were asked to provision for losses for the full cycle. So there were a few things that were done uh, with the GSEs that weren't done with the banks that were overly punitive. And so, I don't know, I, I tend to think that they'll lessen those a little bit and that raising the G fee was the right thing to do. And, and again, it's a small position for us, but I still think if we're right about that, the GSE preferred to trade at eight to 10 cents on the dollar and those could be worth par. 
Kyle, before we run out of time, do you want to show any more slides? I, you have no. people begging for them. Yeah, I know we have, but we've been, we've been, trust us, we've been trying to access it, but we've not seemed lucky on it. It's, the problem is I can't control it. I'm oh, controlling your anywhere? guy in the back. I'd like to be able to fly around with this Is thing, there a so. particular slide you want to go to? Um, let, me, let me go back to the, to, the, um, to the European scenario. Go back to the beginning of Europe, please. Which is in the middle. Yeah, go backwards, please. Target something like slide 15 area. No, forward from there, please. There you go. <clears throat> when we were moving, this is a perfect one to stop on. When we were moving around the world in 2008, trying to understand how Europe was, or the world, was taking these bad private assets on the public balance sheets, uh, we decided to go out and look at public balance sheets. Then we decided to try to look at host countries' banking systems. Really important to see when, what took Iceland down. Iceland had 300,000 people and uh, 20 billion of GDP, and in three banks, they had 200 billion of loans. Yeah. Right? It didn't take yeah. a genius to figure out that Iceland was going to blow up. And, and so at the, at the very height of what just went wrong, what just went wrong was provincial regulators were not paying attention to the size of host country banking systems in relation to the sovereign's substantive ability to take care of that system or at least maintain losses within that system. So if you go to the next slide, um, uh, the next slide uh, shows you in blue, uh, which uh, in blue is on balance sheet sovereign obligations and red is the size of the host country's banking system. And what's interesting is, and we've took Iceland off of here, but it was the, the one on the left. Uh, and there are some idiosyncrasies, uh, but when you look across here, you kind of see that the United States, believe it or not, is way over uh, to the right there. It's, it's call it in the, in the bottom quartile of problems, and you know how bad we have it here. Um, what you realize is the entire Euro European banking system uh, was enormous, and it is enormous. And um, Ireland's on the left, Iceland was on the left, Switzerland is idiosyncratic. There are a couple of banks that, that uh, we don't think Switzerland's going broke. That's been taken out of context. UK is in big trouble. Um, France is in huge trouble. And people aren't focused on the UK. I think there's some asymmetry to the UK from here. But the EMU as a whole, their banking system, uh, including on balance sheet sovereign debt, is almost four and a half times GDP. If you go to the next slide, what's more important than GDP as the denominator are central government revenues. Some economies are much more productive than others. And, and, and I'll c compare and contrast Japan and the US for a second. Um, if, you were, uh, if you wanted to have um, a billion dollars worth of revenue from one of two companies, would you rather have Eli Lilly's revenue or would you rather have Flextronics? Right? You'd have L Lilly's revenue because they have a lot of intellectual property, they have a lot of uh, margin in their business, they have a very productive business. Flextronics is a contract manufacturer, their margins are tiny, they import uh, all their cost of goods sold, uh, they make it a little better and, and sell it for a little bit more than that. Well, that's Japan, right? Japan has no natural resources. They import all of their, all of their inputs. Uh, they make it, they, and, I, and I'm painting with a broad brush. There are some intellectual uh, property-based companies there. But in general, um, when you use central government tax revenue, it is, a, it is a better measure of the productivity of the country's uh, output as opposed to just the broad brush GDP. So if you've read any of the sovereign work, uh, any of the white papers that exist out there over the last 10 years, you'll see that a lot of the work says that when your contingent liabilities become on balance sheet liabilities and your debts get to be more than five times your revenue, you, you get in the problem category. Well, the 5x number is the first uh, row there above the x-axis. Uh, and as you see, um, some of these countries are in this scenario in which their debts are 40 times their central government revenue. Well, what, all it takes is a tiny move in their cost of debt to, to literally detonate them. Uh, and so that's, that's why we're so focused on um, Japan, Ireland, and, and countries like that. You dismiss Switzerland. Why'd you dismiss Switzerland? So in Switzerland, uh, there are really two banks that are the cause of this, Credit and it's Suisse Credit Suisse and UBS. and UBS. And the majority of their assets are in, are in wholly owned subs that are domiciled in the US and Europe. Big in US. So when the shit hits the fan, they just turn, they say, that's your problem, that's it's not yours. our problem. We're called ring um, fence. So um, when you think about private banking in Switzerland, uh, this is a beautiful thing, and we should actually try this here. Um, you don't see many private banks in Switzerland go bust. Do you know why? Um, if you're an officer or director of these banks, 
you have personal liability to the assets of the bank. So once the cap structure of the bank's exhausted, you're on the hook. So their giving shit factor's a lot higher about, yeah. their, <laughs> about their loans. Um, and That's you don't see them going broke, <laughs> right? Um, so it's a great idea, and we should try that. Um, but yeah, again, you can't, I'm, what I'm trying to do is give you a broad idea as to what the world looks like, and then you have to dig in and understand the idiosyncrasies of each country. So I don't think Switzerland is in that bad a shape, I think. Despite the numbers. I think that actually makes the US and Europe in worse shape because they can check it to us. And as we wind down here, at the beginning of the conversation, Todd said, you know, how long is the road? How long do we have? And you said, mm -hmm. I think, three to five years. In the US. In the US. Yeah. What happens? I hope in, that's right. What happens in three to five years? Um, so the silver lining in, in my theory uh, is that our politicians, our people at the Fed and the Treasury, they all have front row seats to what's about to happen in Europe and Japan. And it takes a crisis of that kind of magnitude to um, shake us to our core, to change the path that we're on. Because politically, the path isn't going to be changed, right? That we, this is the way we describe it in our firm. The Republicans and Democrats each have 100-foot putts with 40 feet of break and 20-mile-an-hour winds. And they look at each other and they say, good, good. Yeah. Right? <laughs> That's where we are. That, that is exactly where we sit today. You see these negotiations. OK, you don't, you don't cut my expenditures, and I won't cut your entitlement. Scott, we're good. Let's get to the next one. Let's just raise the ceiling. So I think um, if, if we keep going uh, down that path, and we see what happens in Europe and Japan, maybe that changes the way that we operate. And hopefully it changes that. So, But we still have that option. What's going to happen in Europe is going to happen very soon. Very soon. Here, you mean? In Europe. And as those dominoes fall, it's going to give our politicians a false sense of security. These guys that tell me that the 10 years at two, we don't have a crisis. Well, I actually think it's going to go lower than two. I think the 30 year is going lower as well. Because all of that scared money from Europe and Japan is coming here. Not as an endorsement of our fiscal policy by any mm -hmm. stretch of the imagination, but it's that Pavlovian response to, to safety. And that's what actually scares me the most, that, that we're going to have this false sense of security in the next few years. Todd, do you want to, you got anything else? No, I think. All right. I, I have one, one final question, and I, I hate to keep getting to the dramatic, but in, in the process of putting the program together this year, talking to people about you coming back again, looking at what's happening in the housing market, have we reached bottom or not? Um, I've encountered quite a number of extremely brilliant people, and we always get to a point in the conversation when we're talking about the near future where we start whispering. And the whisper is always, my God, do you really think it's going to get that bad? So everybody tends to expect that things are going to get really bad next year and that there will be some kind of collapse next year, and perhaps it's, it's Europe that starts that. Um, so would you say that the collapse is already happening? Well, for sure. But I don't believe the collective participants believe that, I mean, what I hear today from the litany of people that we talk with uh, is that I think consensus is mild recession in Europe, small, maybe small nominal GDP decline, no recession in the US, small GDP growth, um, we'll work our way through this, the US isn't as bad as Europe, um, and emerging markets where you need to bet all your money because that's where all the convexity is. That, that's, I don't, call, I don't know if you guys agree with that, that's a consensus that I hear. Um, and look, the consensus is never going to be right um, in, in, when things go poorly, mm -hmm. right? And again, it's that general optimism that we all harbor in the back of our minds. I hope we're wrong about this. I have a couple of kids and we live here and you know, the world's going to be a tougher place. But unfortunately, I don't, I don't get paid to be an optimist or a pessimist, I only get paid to be a realist. And, and being a realist in this scenario um, is pretty negative. So the takeaway is don't have a false sense of security. Yes. And learn lessons. Don't, one, other, one other key takeaway is don't believe these governments when they tell you that everything's going to be fine, that they're going to solve these problems. I mean, think about Mexico in 94. I know this, this hit home here for Texas pretty hard. But if you remember the tequila crisis, uh, the Mexican government was making affirmative determinations that they would never restructure, they would never devalue. In fact, 
the day before they devalued 60%, they said we won't devalue. So the government can never tell you what they're about to do. Uh, they try to fight it tooth and nail, and they have to lie to you all along the way. It's just a fact. You know, some of the mm -hmm. ECB bankers have said this publicly um, because it, they'll, be, they'll be accused of being pro-cyclical if they don't lie to you. So I, I think the key takeaway is develop your own opinion. Go look at these numbers. The numbers are pretty, in, pretty easy to go find. And don't listen to me. Go develop your own opinion, and, and maybe you'll find places where you think I'm wrong. I'm, I've been wrong uh, um, plenty of times. I just hope I'm right 51% of the time. Amen. Um, so uh, I, the key is do your own work, because the more you listen to the press, the more you listen to the talking heads, um, they're all pushing to have nothing go wrong. When things go wrong, they'll tell you, we're sorry, we tried. Would you recommend that everybody read This Time It's Different? I think it's a great book. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a great book. We'll, think, we'll give uh, you some recommended reading after the event. For this event, one of the best books I've recently read uh, is All the Devils Are Here. Have you read that by Bethany McLean? No. You have. You just guys heard need. About it. People in this industry need to go read that book. I actually, it was. I couldn't put it. I read it all in one weekend. It was three hundred some odd pages, and the housing chapters and sections that show you how the basis for all of this was put together and who the bad actors are and who the good actors are. Um, I've read a lot of books on the crisis, and this one was one of the best. It, it might be boring on the front end, but as you start getting through there, you won't believe some of the things behind the scenes that went on. Well, Kyle, thank you for coming back three years yeah. in a row. Thank you. And um, I hope that there will be a next year to invite you back again. So thank you so much. Thank you. We now have a 25-minute break.